Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about healthcare or the healthcare system from a sociological perspective, specifically looking at why it is a social problem and areas related to aspects of social problems in healthcare. Again, to introduce this, we need a general understanding of a sociological perspective of healthcare and the healthcare system. So again, we are going to be taking a more of a macro pro approach, looking at the big picture. Two, how does access to health care improve our lives? Is there inequitable access to health care? Things along those lines. So in order to address it, why is it a social problem? One, without access to health care, then, you know, that's associated with how long you live and the quality of life you live. And whether we're talking dental health care or just seeing doctors or whatever it might be, there's this general improvement in overall daily life. Now, what we can see is that throughout history, we've had incredible improvements. If you look back, you know, way back in the day, people would be dead in their mid-30s. And nowadays, people are living into their 80s and 90s and 100s. And it's, you know, is that a relatively new phenomenon? The answer to that is yes. And how did we get there? You know, we can look at science, technology, and then the building of a system to manage the health and health care of society in itself. So historically, people didn't live as long. And if you look at disparities in by biological sex, for example, you know, why were women, you know, were so likely to die just from childcare back in the day? I believe the statistics are something like one in five women would have died from childbirth back in the day. Even in modern times, despite all of our technology, though, and despite all of our historical changes, women are still 22 times more likely to die young than a boy. Why is that? And again, the answer is childbirth and access to health care. If you want to improve the quality of life for all women on this planet, help them deal with the struggles and that come with uh, having babies and help them get access to health care. It's as simple as that. So again, the access to health care, though, is unequally distributed. So if you look globally at who has access to health care, you're going to find that your more industrialized nations or your post-industrialized uh, as nations are going to have more access to health care than your less industrialized nations, for example. And so depending upon the quality of the economy and the health care system of the country of origin, you know, you're going to see disparities in quality. You can also look at variables like race. You know, why in the United States is a black man, ten, you know, going to more likely to die 10 years earlier than a white man? How much of that is oppression and forcing people into poverty? How much of that is diet? How much of that's cultural factors? And then how much of it's things like social stress resulting from racism and stress also resulting from just, you know, general social context factors. So despite whatever variable we're looking at, whether it's social class or race or country of origin or time frame, you are going to see disparities and major changes, albeit historically, you know, African Americans were denied access in modern times that has improved. However, you still see this major gap in lifespan. And why is that? I mean, the number one thing to point to is the effects of racism. What else really explains it? And so that today we're going to be really just focusing on social problems when it comes to health care. I'm going to post up some supplemental lectures for you that really delve deeper into the health care and health care systems and these stats. But what we want to be looking at with this lecture is just to get more specifically, why is it a social problem? Again, it's because there is inequitable access. The access to it, you know, dictates how long you live, predicts your longevity. You know, there's a lot of things we can point to. Uh, but your book opens up talking about general learning objectives, what should we be focusing on for this? So again, what are some of the most pressing healthcare problems in the United States and other high income nations compared to low income nations? Do you see disparities in these? What factors do you see that it might be prevalent in some places that aren't others? So again, I don't want to go too deep into all of this, but if you look at obesity in America, it's much higher than here than it is in other countries. And so much of that's based upon our access to things like sodas and fast foods and high saturated fats, trans poly fats, um, salt, all of these things that play a role. And so you're going to see major disparities. Um, and then if you look at just longevity, but even though we have problems with obesity, we also have this healthcare system. So even despite things like obesity, we have a healthcare system that can better manage that. Whereas low income countries might not even have a healthcare system to manage even the most basic inoculations or whatever it might be. 
Why are people more likely to discuss a physical illness with others as compared with a mental illness? We'll look a little bit at the differences between physical and mental illnesses, and we'll touch a little bit about stigma and things along those lines. But again, I'll put that in some supplemental lectures for you to go real deep. We'll just point out some of the issues associated with why it's a social problem. And then we'll look at private versus public health care and how it is paid in the United States compared to other countries and what effect does this have on the type of care people receive and the inequitable care that people may receive. So to introduce some of these ideas, healthcare as a social problem, we have to understand what it means to for health. So health defined as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. And then illness is this idea um, uh, being socially defined and made you know, change over time and across cultures. Um, but so why is health important? Why do we as a society care about health in general? And then why is it a problem if we're not achieving that status? Again, if the point of society is to have a bunch of social roles that need fulfilled, and if we don't have these roles fulfilled, then society tends to fall apart, then it makes sense to take care of our citizens. Plus, if we're investing time and training and socializing and building up these people and we need them to structure society in order for it to run, it makes sense to invest in taking care of the health of society. You know, it's just like putting money into an investment that'll pay off millions over the years of just having worker bees. You know, that's one way of looking at it. So when we're thinking about health. We're just looking at that general idea of what it means to be healthy, you know, within our biological, psychological, and, you know, social limits. And you might not always think about health in a social way, but, you know, one, if we look at it through social interaction, you have to have the social interaction to be healthy. We can also look at health on a social level in the sense of what's the health of society and does it have a healthcare system to take care of things? We can also look at health in terms of, you know, what it really means, you know, to have access. Do you have the means? Do you have the healthy physical means? And I mean, so you know, not having those healthy physical means can cause stress, hence the effects of things like poverty. So again, does money solve all the problems in the Americas? In the United States, we have tons of money. We have, you know, more money than any other country in the world. However, our healthcare system has good parts to it and it has bad parts to it. It has good parts to it in the sense that yes, we have a lot of technology and a lot of money that we can put into research and things along those lines, but it's also very expensive and we have to put out thousands of dollars into our health care in order to get it. And then some people don't have as good of health care and they can't be able to pay for everything that somebody who's rich might be able to pay for, for example. So again, when we're looking at things like health, we're just asking, okay, how do we bring people up to the greatest possible par we can to make sure they're worker bees? And then again, what do we have to do as a society to invest in that? And America's kind of always been at this like, you know, kind of a paradox where we have the means to take care of everybody, but we don't take care of everybody. There's inequality between those that have much and there's great inequality between the, those that don't have enough. So again, we need to be asking ourselves, why is healthcare a social problem in the United States? And again, we can just point to things like it's inequitable. We have the means, yet we don't take care of everybody. We could make it so people have a better, better physical, mental, and social well-being, but we choose not to. Again, there's a lot more people that we could help if we could put some more money into medicine or if we could make access to health care more accessible. There's a lot more people we could help if we open our doors to, you know, taking care of people's minds along with their body and not necessarily stigmatize them for feeling the things that they're feeling. And we can help their social well-being by considering how can we improve their economic well-being and improve their education and improve their job prestige and access to better health care. And then as a society, we need to ask ourselves, do we want to keep it in this inequitable way where some people have access and some people don't, where some people have the means to that really good cancer saving technology and other people don't? Or do we want it level it out the playing field and make it more public. We can ask questions like, should the government take over healthcare? Is that better? But then you can look at problems to that because if you look at books like Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, what happens when you turn over a whole field to the state? 
does it become stagnant? Do we need to incentivize to create new medical technologies and be constantly pushing that field through competition? But that's a capitalist point of view. So right now we have kind of a capitalist, privatized social system in place for healthcare. We do have some public healthcare options such as Medicare and things along those lines. But currently, it's a pretty much a pay-for system. It's not something that everybody has access to. And as a result, you tend to see inequalities. Like, why is a black female with a really high education level less likely in a good job, less likely or more likely to have, you know, problems or um, having a baby than someone who's a white female with a high school degree? And again, you have to point to, well, that black female growing up, were they more likely to be poor because they were black and they were oppressed? Does that mean they had less access to good health care and good diet when they were a kid? And does that increase the likelihood that they're going to lose their baby? And the answer is yes. And that's not fair at all that a black female is more likely to lose a baby than a white female, twice as likely, but they are. And again, in a sociological perspective, we have to ask why. Why is a black female more likely to lose her baby than a white female? And again, it has nothing else to do with just simple access to health care and quality of diet and other things that white privilege can get you. <laughs> and I mean, that might sound a little bit harsh. But again, we're asking, you know, we're looking at just just a bunch of different factors of why, you know, health and health care can be social problems in the United States. And when you start to look at all the intersecting variables between being female and being black and being poor and how that increases your likelihood of you know losing a baby or having less access to good food or less access to high quality health care, you start to see major disparities between racial groups. And so you can't deny it. Just look up the statistics of disparities in health. Uh, outcomes related to races, and you're just going to see prime examples of statistics that stand out, you know. And again, we need to be asking why. But if we had a balanced system where everybody had the same access to health care, would you see those, you know, disparities between races? Would you see those disparities between social classes? And maybe that would balance out the equation. But right now, in the United States, if you take a macrocosmic perspective, what you will see is there is inequality between social classes, between genders, and between races, for example, when it comes to access to health care, quality of health care, and who lives the longest. Like, women live longer than men, for example. Why? You know, there's a lot of reasons for this. Biological reasons, such as estrogen psychological reasons such as having more support more communication more social you know they're more social so they're getting all those benefits like the neurotransmitter releases of oxytocin and dopamine and things along those lines but also in the social context you know are they are they more interactive are they more communicative are they more tapped into people and so you start to see some disparities and you know you got to ask why do men not live as long and then men don't live as long because also risk taking behavior for example and the types of jobs men work and things along those lines and so you're going to see disparities between these groups so again, people that have means have more access to health care than those that don't. That increases their likelihood to live longer, you know, less likely to get all kinds of other health problems. When you look at things like genders, women live longer to answer that question why. Again, we always have to take that biopsychosocial approach. Same thing with races. It's not because somebody's biologically different that they don't live as long. It's because of the effect of socially constructed racial categories and how that subjugates people into the lower classes and then reduces their access to health care, for example. So even though we're throwing tons of money at the problem, and you know, I guess what does it say? The US spent $2.5 trillion, 17% of our gross domestic product. It's quadrupled over the last three decades. I mean, health care costs are just skyrocketing through the roof. And I mean, you could ask why, you know, is it CEO bonuses? Is it the elite, the stockholders controlling the money? They're just increasing their bonuses. You know, what's the answer? Is it price gouging? Is it just inflation? You know, there's a lot of reasons for this. But despite our spending all of this money, you still see tons of inequitable health care, you know, between groups. All right. And so you can also ask, is the private 
you know, are we just spending too much money? Is two point five trillion dollars too much? If we were to, you know, make that public and have the government fund healthcare and it would just come out of our taxes, would we end up spending less money than that? I'd have to do the math and kind of compare and contrast. But again, throughout this lecture we should be considering private versus public insurance. What's better? Is it better if private companies have insurance and then we just pay for that through our jobs or just with cash money? Or is it better if it's like a government sponsored thing? You know, that's just something we should be asking. Um, your book introduces some of the ideas like uh, when it comes to disability, mental health, AIDS, some of the health uh, concerns that we've had over the years. I'm not going to go get too deep into that again. I'm going to put some supplemental ones up there. Um, it gets into institutionalization versus deinstitutionalization where over time we have removed the amount of institutions that are in our society to deal with some of these problems like the mental health and things along those lines. Yes, there's been some positives because we've closed down some state institutions that were just absolutely horrendous, which is where all the horror movies pretty much come from. But at the same time, where are these people to go if they can't get the help? So again, if you have people that don't have access to health care and they can't get the psychological or physical treatment, what are they going to do? Does that increase the use of drugs? Does that increase the use of homelessness? And so you start to see all these other problems. Does that increase the likelihood of violence and burglaries and things along those lines? Crime, stealing from Walmart. You know, it's all these little things that you might find. But maybe if we had some government programs where they didn't have to pay a ton of money, they can get access to some support, some help, you might see some benefits there. Um, yeah, so we've covered most of the big ones, though. We should be looking at just disparities between groups, between races, classes, and uh, biological sexes. We're looking at some of the things that society should concern itself with, like should we be taking care of people that have disabilities? Should we take care of children and the elderly that can't take for themselves? Should we have government programs and institutions in place to take care of them? And we do, it's not like we don't, but again, that's there's a reason that we made these programs in the first place. Even though we kind of have this capitalized, you know, privatized, insurance kind of system in america we still have public social policies and programs addressed to help people that are sick that are needy because as a society we realize that's also important to take care of them you know so we do have social programs in place but again they're not sufficient to deal with the demand and you always hear about the backup of bureaucracy and how long it takes to get appointments and that you know these doctors and these lawyers are all overworked trying to deal with all this kind of stuff and that makes complete sense because that's the way it is so again i don't want to go too deep in the whole bureaucratization of the healthcare systems and all the problems that come with the bureaucracy of the healthcare system and the we could look at it from like a systems analysis or program evaluation analysis like a bean counter and accountant and go through a hospital line by line to look at waste and where we're paying too much money to cut costs on the consumers and we could go deep into all of these concepts but i do not want to bore you with all this today because literally i would be here for days so again i put up a couple of things for you but again why is it a social problem one there's inequitable access between these groups okay Two, if we don't take care of people, then you end up having that, you know, less workers, less people to contribute to society. And so we need to make sure we have these kinds of systems in place. But again, if we're going to put one of these systems in place, what kind of a system should we put in place? And that's something that we've been kind of debating back and forth. You always hear the politicians saying yes to Medicaid, then no to Medicaid, and then now you'd cut, you don't, you will never cut Medicaid. And then somebody suggested later on, okay? Um, but so your book introduces this idea of the crisis in American healthcare, and it looks at those with insurance, those compared to those without insurance. Like, look at your graph down here on the bottom left. Incomes of seventy-five thousand dollars or more, only ten percent of them don't have insurance. Incomes of less than twenty-five thousand, twenty-five percent of them don't have insurance. And so you can see that the cost of insurance is influencing the average American and the average American family to whether or not to pay for health care or to pay for their bills. And it looks like a huge percentage of Americans just really struggle to pay for health care and their bills. If we averaged out all these numbers, you know, between all these groups, you know, you'd find a significant percentage of Americans that just don't have insurance. 
Would they have insurance if it was more affordable? So again, is there a crisis in American healthcare and that the high cost of healthcare is making it completely unaffordable for the average American family? And then you got to ask questions like, how is that affecting the family, which we'll talk about next chapter? Why do we have two parent working households? Is it because the American health care has gone up so much, daycare has gone up so much, rent's gone up so much that even if wanted, someone wanted to stay home with the kids, they couldn't afford to? Okay, there's inequitable access between groups, as you're seeing here in this chart, between social class, but also between races and genders. We have passed the Affordable Care Act. We have passed Medicaid. Um, we've introduced social programs for you know, over the last several decades to try to deal with these social problems of making sure that you know the average American can get average access to health care, and even those who are, don't make enough money can get have access to health care. But it's always going back and forth with the government, how often we're willing to spend and who actually meets the criteria to be able to get that. And so some people that make just a little bit too much money, you know, to be able to get, you know, government health care or whatever it might be, they still don't have enough money left over to get health care. And so, you know, many Americans are having to make that decision every month of do can I afford health care or not? And as you can see, it's a significant proportion that is not. OK. Um, yeah, so we've talked about race, class, and gender access. Um, we've talked about, we haven't introduced the idea of treatment inequalities either. So if you get a kind of stigma theory, you can ask questions like, well, if a black female is going to a hospital, why does she wear a college jacket, for example? You know, and it, because then it impresses upon them like, hey, I have an education. You can't just, I'm not just someone off the street. But why does a black female have to go out of their way to make sure they know at a hospital, they're not just some random off the street. It's because, you know, our blacks treat the same as whites in hospital settings. And there's so much research on that. Again, I don't want to go too deep into that. But again, if you look at the stigma of how LGBTQIA plus people are treated by healthcare workers, the bias, how black people are treated by healthcare workers, the bias, there is so much stigma research out there on this. You know, there's lots of qualitative data, people telling their stories of their experience, and it's an absolute, you know, social fact. And, you know, you might not think how racism comes out in many ways, but again, just being black and trying to go to the hospital, you could very likely experience racism in those kinds of situations, okay? And then your book also talks about how there's inequality in who actually becomes a physician. You know, there is a need for more representation and who actually becomes a doctor when it comes to males versus females and when it comes to minority races and ethnicities compared to whites for example historically it was always white men women were never allowed access they were relegated to being at least nurses you know through the 50s and then by the 60s it started to open doors and by the 1980s you started to see a ton more female doctors but still there's not it hasn't balanced the equation has not balanced out Okay, so there still is a need for female doctors. There's a major gap in Latino and black doctors, for example. And, you know, if you think about Native American doctors, that's probably one of the most important ones because, like, why are Native Americans scared to go to a white doctor? You know, through the 1970s, 40% of Native American women were sterilized. Native American women get sick, show up at a hospital, and next minute you know they're sterilizing her. Literally true stories. Just go look up the sterilization of Native Americans by the U.S. medical profession and the U.S. government. It's absolute appalling part of our history. Um, but yeah. All right. So people of color across class lines and low-income whites typically receive less preventative care and less optimal management of chronic diseases than others do. And so again, low income people, including whites, and there is a significant proportion of poor whites that also fit into this package. They just don't experience the racism and a, that kind of form of oppression that blocks them from access and rising up the social class ladder, but they still experience all the forms of poverty that someone who's poor would experience. Um, interventions, because Acute illness like measles, polio are largely under control with vaccinations and improved public health practices. Most health problems today are chronic diseases, um, such as arthritis, diabetes, heart disease, or disabilities like back injuries, hearing or vision problems, mental retardation, which requires long-term treatment. 
So we have to ask the question of, does the state have the right to intervene in these medical situations? Can they mandate vaccinations and things along those lines? And again, in a, in a, in a place of freedom, you've always had a lot of back and forth on that. But again, to, you know, at the way that they've kind of gotten around that is like in order to attend public schools, for example, you have to have evidence or proof of dot, 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 dot. They do that because they have determined that it's a safety factor, and so they've developed policies, laws, procedures to, in you know, put these interventions in place for what they deem as public safety. And again, not to get into a debate, but you've obviously, hopefully, seen the debates that have occurred over things like vaccinations and public health over the last several years. So definitely worth looking into some of that so you can hear some of the back and forth on that. Uh, medical advances mean that many people who were born with serious disabilities survive, as do many who would have died from acute illnesses or accidents earlier times. Again, in modern times, is it the state's responsibility to take care of people in these situations? And that's what we as a society had to decide to do over time. Um, and it's the same thing with like, um, you know, having places for kids to go when, you know, they don't have parents or their parents are, you know, very abusive and traumatizing and the kids need to be removed, you know, at what point should the state intervene? It's those kinds of situations that we should be asking. Um, but again, as more people survive and live longer, we are more likely to experience chronic illnesses and disabilities. And so again, should the state take care of the elderly? What you're going to find is those that are young and those that are old tend to be the most at risk for health problems, also the most at risk for things like poverty and not being able to take care of themselves. And so we as a society, is it our role to step in? And so if it is our role, then how do we solve that social problem? How do we take care of the children and the elderly? How do we take care of those that are poor? And again, if you don't take care of those that are poor, that's also a huge way to go and spread disease. Like back in the day in early industrialization or when you had armies traveling across the world, just problems of dysentery would wipe out whole populations. Simply having clean drinking water and so again, I don't want to go like too deep in all of this because we're already at a half hour. This lecture will go on for days. But like, you know, we have to think about public health concerns and people in general. And I mean, whether it's from our water quality to making people sick or having, you know, the means to deal with diseases. And when they pop out, like measles was devastating back in the day, whooping cough polio we didn't these are things that like you don't even think about right now but i mean this wasn't too long ago where then people suffered with this kind of stuff right i mean i mean I, yeah, I was thinking about all the fevers they had all these fevers like different names for different types of fevers back in the day you know i think it was my aunt who had something called like purple fever or something like that i was just trying to remember but she was out for like two years on the couch and she's still a little bit wrecked to this day you know, and just that's just from a fever when she was a kid. And they tell stories about how she would be in the living room at like seven years old on a couch, unable to move. And people would just, you know, her, all of her family, her brothers and her sisters and stuff would sit with her and hang out with her and spend time with her and take care of her, you know. And that's the other side of it. You know, whose responsibility is it? Is it the family? Is it the state? Are we responsible for each other? At what point should we intervene? At what point should we look at the disparities in this being a public problem or is it a private problem? Whose problem is it to take care of everybody, okay? So again, here we can add these theories. We can look at this idea of health in the healthcare system through the, uh, I'm so sorry, through the sociological theories. Um, so from a functionalist perspective, again, what is the purpose of society taking on these responsibilities and why do we socially construct a healthcare system? What role does this play for us? What's the purpose? What's the function of doing that? And again, sick people are not responsible for their incapacity. They are exempted for their usual role and task obligations. They must want to leave the sick role and get well. They are obligated to seek and comply with the advice of a medical professional. Functionalist theory would generally ask, you know, do we need these people? We need them to fill these social roles. We need to take care of them. 
so that they can make sure society runs. Without people doing their roles and without having well people, we can't take care of the structures in society that need taken care of. Conflict theory is going to argue group versus group. The healthcare system is, you know, inequitably, it's accessible. Only those with means can access it. Um, wealthy patients and patients with good insurance might receive high quality care in the medical industrial complex. Low income and poverty level people often do not. And again, why is this the case? High health care costs in the U.S. because we have advanced medical services and we use expensive medications and technology. <laughs> That's absolutely true. You go into an emergency room and you, they start hooking up machines and scanning you for this and that and giving you all these drugs. Well, how do you get all those machines? Where do all the drugs come from? You have to have an entire infrastructure to take care of that. It looks at things like the abuse of these existing systems and how like, you walk into an ER and they start scheduling you for all this stuff that you probably don't even need. And then they, the book talks about like in other countries where they don't necessarily just hook you up to every machine and charge you thousands of dollars for every little thing they do. They kind of take a different approach to it. And then also looking at the aging population, again, how that's going to affect us. But with conflict theory, again, we're looking at the inequality between the groups and how that affects us. We're looking at group versus group and how they compete for resources. And those with the means have the better means to compete for good, high access quality to health care. And symbolic interactionists would say, we're the ones who constructed this world. We're the ones who made this inequitable system. We could easily make a new health care system that takes care of everyone. If that's what we want, all we have to do is build it. But instead, we built this capitalistic, privatized insurance with a few social programs to take care of the really sick, needy, elderly, and children. But after that, it's pretty much every man for themselves or every person for themselves. So, you know, those are just a quick couple of ideas on this chapter. Um, I am putting up a couple supplemental lectures because, again, this could go on for days if we went into all the avenues we could look at. But again, just to make it quick and concise, we're just looking at how inequality results in unequal access to health care. Globally, places that have higher industrialized societies tend to have higher, better education or uh, health care systems. And then those, pe those you know, countries, those people in those countries tend to have longer life expectancies. You can look at bias and treatment in the healthcare system. Again, looking at inequalities between race, class, and um, gender or biological sex. These are just a couple of quick, concise points to make it out for you. And uh, wish you all the best. Thank you so much.